It's episode 365 of This is Whole Life and a moment of silence for the 2023 Great Question series. It's pretty great. Yeah, that was a brief moment of silence, but <laughs> very, it very works. Brief. It works because it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not much on that silence thing. No, he's just like, let's just give us. I was also just thinking that if this is episode 365, you could listen to an episode for See? every day of the year, and you would be able. You know, you yeah. could go. You could. You Ken could just have, stole my opening thunder. Sorry, <laughs> you know, Randy. You, uh, yeah, that, no problem. No problem. Probably should tell me what your opening thunder is, so I don't. <laughs> no, you. What did else it. do you have in your back pocket? You took it well. You, you did it really well. No, I. I just wanted to say, uh, get well quick to whole life staff who is not at work today. <laughs> Jeff being one of them, uh, the bug is going around. It's like four missing today, right? Yeah, and I've heard from other people that. Um, we're trying to get a hold of me to let me know something and they weren't going to be around later because they were sick and I lost my phone this weekend, so I'm not getting text messages. So, you know, well, this has been fun. To... I need to go home. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is over. So we're just, we're like, we're knocking all these things off. So everyone that's sick. Well, Melanie looks like she should, uh, should have gone home though, because uh, <laughs> she just jacket. got done moving, right? Yeah. She, she spent She's Memorial tired. Day weekend moving from one house to another i did so, i think i personally handled about three tons worth of stuff <laughs> i think so that truck that truck was loaded it had to be that much or more fortunately i did have a lot of help thanks to uh everyone who came including the people in this room there was appreciate good, you all there were some good people there that's this what the podcast people are for that's right, right jeff <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow oh. Well, that's what happens when you call in sick <laughs> we are welcoming the fact that you are are not bringing your sickness to us, but that doesn't mean when the fastball comes across the plate, I, you can, you we're not going to swing at it. Swing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to, and this maybe was the best question, but also I feel like the most struggled with or the continued struggle is going to be real. And we're going to get to Doc Mom in a little bit with some questions. She had four or five, and I felt like. I kind of felt like her as we were moving through the message because mm -hmm. every time you'd say something and you had great stories, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, thank, and I also wanted to say thank you to Kyla and Eric for letting you tell <laughs> the <laughs> red lips story. The red lips theory. And, Just yeah, I want, make that a thing, thing, by the way. Yeah, no. And if you didn't uh, catch the message, please do, because the stories alone had the value that you to, just for the entertainment value. And then we got those led into the meat of the message. So definitely uh, don't miss it. And then um, I got an email this week uh, from someone who listens to the podcast. And even though it came to my personal inbox, hmm. I felt like it was really the theme of the team that needed to hear this. So hello, sir. So I'll say hello, podcast people. So mm. far, so good. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope you're well as the week winds down. I've listened to the podcast for some time and I have a couple of thoughts. And those thoughts are, Thank you for how hard you work to share love in words. Oh, that's so nice. I thought that was really yeah. a nice way that yeah. uh, someone was complimenting the work that we do and, and that we try really so hard to do that. So, and, you know, I also just wanted to say that for those that, you know, put out questions every week, for those that send a text or email, you're part mm -hmm. of the team too. You're mm -hmm. part of the whole life family. Just like if you watch church online, you're joining us, this is part of the worship experience. It's just in a different format. So, didn't really give me permission to use your name, so I'm not going to. But you know who you are. And if you're listening, I'm assuming you're still listening if you've been listening a while. So thank you for the kind words. I really sure. appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. All right. First question, Ken, was... We probably ought to review just for somebody who may have not heard the message. Well, what was the uh, What was the question for this last week? Melanie, what was it? Did I write it down? It oh, was, here it is. <laughs> why did Jesus, Jesus have to die? Couldn't God just have forgiven us? Yeah. And I feel like that, that doesn't that question start in like first grade or kindergarten where you're just like, yeah. this all seems really complicated. That seems like there should have been an easier way to do this. Yeah. So, Ken, you said that before you uh, before you really started to break down what you were going to say in the message, you were like, ah, that's an easy question. I got this. I know what I'm going to say. Yep. So what were you going to say and how much of it made the message and how much of it was a maybe a different direction or an offshoot or – um, I think that probably my automatic response is to get into um, the Seventh Day Adventist Church's great controversy theology. Probably my, you know, kind of my go-to for me. It's something that makes sense. It, it intellectually works for me as well as emotionally. And so, like I said, I thought I knew what I wanted to say, and I started reading through a lot of the other 
theories and other things. And I was like, oh, okay, so this doesn't probably feel as satisfying for other <laughs> groups of people as it does for me. How do I talk about this topic in a way that that shares the faith and hope that I have while still leaving room for other people to experience faith and hope mm. in ways that are meaningful and useful to them as well. So if I looked up the science of redemption, it, mm-hmm. would that it, would that lead me like in a online yeah. search to find out more like what maybe what you were looking at or Yeah, if you just typed in to Google science of redemption Alan White, you'll you'll pick up some quotes pretty quick. Um but at the end of the book of the book that Alan White wrote called The Great Controversy that she talks about this a bit. It's in some other devotionals and some other places where she talks about it being the science of redemption and it's she talks about it being something that that angels study so that kind of gives you an idea that if um, Great. Angels perfect, haven't figured perfect it out. beings who have been around for a long time <laughs> are <laughs> scratching their heads on it then um <laughs> In First Timothy, you know, it's a great mystery, and angels yeah. have studied it, and and maybe that's why, as much as you can try, and as much, and I thought you did a great job of of trying to pull something together or a, a thought process that is logical and that moves you from A to B, and at least says, okay, well, here's some possibilities. It may not be a thousand percent. I mean, if we're going to take eternity to, to figure this out, <laughs> we probably, like you said, wouldn't jam it into a 25-minute sermon and compl- er, er, and say that we would have that covered. Well, and I love what it's, it's, it's called the fellowship of the mystery. All hmm. these people gathered around trying to figure out this mystery of of Christ in us. We're part of the fellowship of the mystery. It sounds like a really exclusive group. It does. It sounds... Like sort of esoteric. Yeah, it feels like it was written by Tolkien or something. Oh, yeah, right? something. <laughs> it sounds like smart people are. Speaking involved. of speaking of Tolkien, which moves me to C.S. Lewis, that was one of the things that didn't <laughs> that didn't make it into the. Uh, you guys get the connection, right? <laughs> they were they're all no, they're was, all part was, of their own fellowship. Yeah. Funny. Yes, all right, we, so. we followed you. We're there. I'm just making sure that somebody's following me. Out <laughs> no, there, no, no, no. So. We're fo- I just I get for those of you listening to this who are not in this studio right now. <laughs> My point is that I was what I, what didn't make it into the sermon was um, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, uh, where Aslan um, is killed by the white witch, and on these stone tablets, which crack in two. So C.S. Lewis not being overly subtle there, um, <laughs> but um, but what's interesting, what was interesting to me there, and I, I was trying to figure out a way to work it into the sermon, just never. It didn't didn't quite work for me, but he calls he calls why Aslan talks about why that it's part of the deep magic, mm-hmm. and I thought that was just such an interesting phrase, the deep magic from when the world began, and the the White Witch is familiar with this deep magic, and she knows that the life of an innocent must be given up. Um, willingly on behalf of of somebody who is is guilty, and then they can be forgiven, redeemed, whatever you want to say. And if you haven't read the book, you're just going to have to go read it. But the point is, what the White Witch wasn't familiar with is what what Aslan tells Lucy and and Susan was the even deeper magic that before. The world was cre- Narnia was created. The even deeper that the emperor across the sea had that if that innocent victim did it, then that th- then that innocent would be brought back to life. And and so it's you know <laughs> it's as good as an explanation as anything. It's like it's just magic. It's just <laughs> deep deep magic. And, and now I got to go read the book. Yeah. If you haven't Good. done it, Randy, you ought to put it on your reading list for okay. this year. All right. In fact, you should put the whole series on on the reading list. I think Ellie's read them all, but I, so have, I think you, we, have I, you really not read the I haven't the, the Chronicles? You, that was what? you know, I don't think oh, that was allowed. No, 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 no. I don't think that was allowed where I grew up. It has, uh, the, it has the witch in the title. Well, I'm it pretty, had magic in it and magic. So I'm pretty sure that was not allowed. I mean, I, I'd never heard of C.S. Lewis, and and when until I got to the academy where people were like, "Well, you, what do you mean you never? You know, what do you?" What do you mean you haven't read this book? And I'm they just look like, down on you like I yeah, just did. Okay. Yeah, no, it, and it, it felt good. You need to well, read it. Uh, it's, it's available a, in audiobook, so you can um, just get the whole series and listen and it's to it for hours. Ar- and it's a great audio because it's yeah. it's um 
It's radio theater, really. It's done dramatically? Oh, yeah. Oh, then it's that super I, then good. I probably like that. Super mm, good. But I like reading, too. Best book. Hmm. I challenge podcast people to disagree with me. Best book in the series, not even close, The Last Battle. Whoa. Okay. Not well, even close. If you have a difference of opinion, throw it out. I don't know. I kind of like a horse and his boy. That's, I think that these I don't are know. all part of a. So this is part of a. The series? horse and yeah. his boy. You like the horse and his boy the best. Yeah. That's well, a, it just. It was I, I would say that's. It was in just my, an interesting approach. I think it's book. in my top three, but hmm. it, the last battle for Wait me is so, just where it is. Just such a. These are thick books, are they not? No. 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 Uh-uh. no these, these are were, easy. These are like. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're oh. they're written for kids, but with the the extra layers in there that that make them intriguing. I'm for thinking adults. of a different series that I know that's on the shelf. So maybe 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 they don't. I don't know. I'll now Tolkien, on the other <laughs> hand, <laughs> those are thick books. Those are thick books. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so. Well, okay. So there's a challenge. If you uh, if you have a favorite, let us know. Would love to uh, would love to find out because I'll need to know which one to read first. But you know, that's the that I think that the power of of those kind of books is when you when you use story t- for metaphor and allegory, it really helps with really complex topics. And that's really what I was trying to go for in this sermon was to take some stories and. Let those be the 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 trampoline that you bounce off of as you, you know, the story about the senator that I really liked that I had to do a bad story about, and it really bothered him because he thought you know he, you were coming after him, yeah. And where does that take you? What is that? What is that in the, in terms of why Jesus had to die? Why couldn't we just be forgiven? You know, how does that line up? Does it? Does it? prompt some thoughts is it is there some 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 there's there's parts of it that would work there's parts of it that wouldn't really work very well metaphorically so but that's that's the beauty of a story is it it really helps you not because the story lines up perfectly but maybe just because it doesn't and it helps you contrast and look at what works and what doesn't work and so I'm glad you chose the story route versus like the proof proof text, text. Mm-hmm. Yeah. like you were doing because I think that we've almost done that to death sometimes where you're like well here we go and then sometimes I feel like that also gives us maybe a little bit of permission in our mind to go <laughs> put that Bible together and like come over here a little bit closer so I can smack you with it because it's yeah. if you have the Bible text that you've already been through and you have maybe an idea and like you said you're trying to take this and you're trying to pull it together in a story that people can follow in even if it's to contrast. I think that there's a there's a real benefit and I I enjoyed that each one of the stories but also in the value of even the first one with the the drunk driver and the yeah. the family saying no, I don't I want to have a talk with this this young man, but I also yeah. enough enough blood's been shed, enough lives have been ruined, can we just, you know, do try a different approach and Man, if that one didn't leave a lump in your throat if you're a parent, um, yeah, right. wowzers. And that made me immediately think of you and, and what we talked about last time of you getting a chance to speak to the young man in the court. And that puts a whole nother spin. That puts a personal – that puts heart equity into what you feel, especially once you know somebody. And I can't imagine how hard it would have been, and especially as a DA too, because then you're – you're taking a hit when people think, "What a fool! Like this guy's a chump." If you, why would you let somebody off that that you know did something so heinous? And there's so many pieces of that. There's so many people that had to do the right thing, and it was so hard on each of their parts to do the right thing. I thought that story really. And isn't that interesting maybe, when it comes to maybe the the science of redemption? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It just packed a punch to me. Yeah, I, I just heard something this morning, something about if your theology can't be, if your theology isn't a story, then maybe there's something wrong with your theology. But I think, hmm. I mean, you were talking about, you know, beating somebody over the head with the Bible. <laughs> I think that's what you do when you feel like you've reached an arrival point and you have the hmm. answer that you want. But I mean, Ken, you were talking about, you know, this whole science of redemption and testing theories and that sort of thing. I mean, this is an active process. This is a continual active process. You don't beat somebody <laughs> over the head. Well, I guess you could beat someone over the head with the theory, but but it's a different process <laughs> <seen> it <laughs> than than arriving somewhere. You know, yeah. it's it's, well, it's, it's alive. It's it's living theology. I think one of the more fascinating things that as Seventh Adventists we often like to kind of gloss over this quote from from Ellen White, but she says the truth is progressive, mm-hmm. and take that quote and really think that one through, because we. W- 
we and I I will say this all day long. I believe that that there are absolutes that that truth is absolute, and yet apparently Ellen didn't agree with that. She thought that truth was progressive. So can something be progressive and absolute at the same time? Maybe, but it's I don't know. It's a fascinating thing that basically that you know it, it's like. I guess maybe it's like saying that math is progressive, that, that, you know, when you're in kindergarten, you weren't necessarily wrong, but you just didn't, you know, you weren't ready for the calculus. You weren't, you, yeah, it's you know, weird. when you look and you go, you know, sometimes the equation that you thought was always true isn't always true mm -hmm. depending on advanced math. And, and so, but that's, that's tough in itself because what if that, piece is one of the cards at the bottom of the stack mm. that are holding up so many other pieces. And then you have to start questioning, well, if this isn't, then what's the card next to it doing? And what's the card that's sitting on top of it doing as your house of cards of philosophy or theology starts to feel like it's maybe not as tight as it once was? And I think that's where I think we've said many times on this podcast, I am happy for people to question their beliefs. Mm -hmm. I am yeah. happy for people to dig in and really know, I think there is nothing that bothers me more than people who are intellectually lazy and rely on the Bible study that others have done, and all they can do is regurgitate what they've heard somebody else say. And it bothers me because as soon as a person like that gets starts hearing other viewpoints, they are completely lost and completely unable mm -hmm. to go ahead and say oh okay well that's your viewpoint and that's an interesting one let me think that through instead you just say, oh no 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 i can't that can't be true and it's interesting to me how much as seventh day adventists we want other denominations other christians to question their beliefs <laughs> yeah. and, and but we're but we're going to be like no no i'm not going to i'm not going to and it's just like I've always told my children, I'm not worried about you questioning your beliefs. I'm not, a, I, I want you to, because if it's true, I don't, Jesus said, Jesus said that whoever, you know, whoever knocks, the door will be opened. Um, and I just don't believe that anyone who's sincerely searching for Jesus will ever be fooled or be turned away or will be deceived because they were searching truly to know Jesus. I just, I believe that, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And Jesus will lead you. The spirit of truth will lead you into all truth, if that's what you're looking for. Well, and I don't think truth is one dimensional. Right. I think truth is this effervescent, multifaceted, fascinating, you know, thing of its own. And it's, and it's our access to that truth through our particular context that maybe changes or becomes more progressive, or we, you know, we, we access more of it or access it from a different angle. I think I just like, I mean, I love reading about, you know, quantum theory. I'm not smart enough to understand it, but I love reading about it. But just because it puts me in touch with something that is so huge, it just sort of puts everything in perspective. And I think when we come up against the truth that we're talking about is so big and it's so, I mean, you mentioned deep magic. I mean, maybe, maybe that's in the same realm of this deep magic, mm. this deep, um, this deep well of truth or, or this multi-dimensional aspects of truth. You know, truth is maybe bigger than we make it sometimes. I think even if it's a a truth that you really hold dear, if you're if you're coming at it from the way Ken described it, to me, I've explained it to other people like it's a black and white description. When you when they say, why do you love the Sabbath? And you go, well, it's the fourth commandment and you can go when you can rattle off all these different things instead of when it's your, when you've really studied it and you've really decided why this is beautiful to me, why has, why has God shown me that this is beautiful to me? You'll describe that in like full 8K, as many colors and sounds and smells as you can put into it. And then people go, Ooh, wow. You, I mean, you really have thought this through. This is really important to you. I can see your heart in it. Where the other argument is like, well, sure, that's black and white. It's pretty easy, it's, it, but it doesn't have the same, to me, it doesn't have the same impact if we're at, if others are asking us why we believe something other than, well, 
I guess I could have looked that part up online, <laughs> hmm. but I didn't get the part. I didn't get the heart part of it. So I think one of the other interesting things is, and that's what I was like. I said, "Oh, I know what I, I think about this," and then I started reading through the other theories <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and reading through all the proof texts that they use to back up their theories. I was like, "Oh, I mean, yeah, I can see where you're coming from on that." Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't intellectually satisfy me the way that my theory does, and it doesn't feel emotionally right. Hmm. It's kind of like the doctrine of hell. When people believe in an ever-burning eternal hell, I don't go, oh, I don't know how you come to that. I, 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 you, you put together the Bible verses, and it's, it's, yeah, there's Bible verses there to, you know, back that up. The story of, of, you know, the rich man and Lazarus doesn't help out a whole lot for my theological belief that there isn't an everlasting hell. Um, but for me, I've found the theory that for me is intellectually satisfying and, and emotionally satisfying. I think we have to be careful about that word emotions, but at the same time, it's our emotions. People like to think they're a lot more logical than they are um, and that they're using when, in fact, really they're using their emotions and saying that it's logic. Yeah. Um, so anyway, well, I don't know if it's is. I mean, you can easily separate your emotions from your logic. I think being being, you know, sentient and also emotional beings, all of that stuff gets mixed up sometimes. Hmm. I was reading. Well, I can't remember the book I was reading recently that basically said um, your emotions on the <laughs> end, your reason are kind of your reason is the guy on top of the elephant and the elephant is your emotions. <laughs> and <laughs> That's a metaphor. <laughs> there you go. I think it and, works. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Well, the one thing that I had never heard before, and it's probably because I'm, you know, I haven't gone to school for what you guys have done, but substitutionary atonement. Yeah. And so I was something new and. Um, just for giggles, I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> for giggles? Did, how, were you giggling after you were done? No. I'm a little concerned about what you do for a good time, Randy. <laughs> well, after hearing some of the stories from earlier today, I feel like yeah. you've really uh, go, gone in a different direction. Well, yeah. Well, you know, you got to find you got to find your entertainment somewhere these days. But it, it made me just it was it it piqued my curiosity. One because I hadn't heard of it before, and you know. Ken can only dive so deep into the weeds on this when it's like, look, here we go, guys. Here's the short of it. We all all are going to disagree. We'll agree that this is a thing, but we're not going to agree on what it means, even across Christianity. There's going to be many, many interpretations of it. And you said, Jesus, basically, you kind of boiled it down. Jesus took on the penalty of your sins and substituted himself in your place. We've heard that before, but mm-hmm. then to put this other idea on there and then just to start reading just i mean just to like the opening paragraphs of some of these different ideas and just how divergently it was just, it, it, they're not even in the same ballpark <laughs> it, it's just it, it's all over the place and you'll find some that have some of the some similar language and maybe some and similar ideas but couldn't god just forgive us and it's yes but <laughs> you know, there, there has to be a but on the mm. end of it. And I feel like when just going through it and the, the part that maybe made the most sense to me out of this with the little bit of time that we had was the, the you mentioned already the story of the senator that uh, you interviewed and mm-hmm. who you were friends with. And in kind of describing that, you, you talked uh, about God sending himself in Jesus which is another one that might take a while to figure out and how that can possibly be. But you said he didn't send someone else to do his dirty work. And I'm just like, he didn't send someone else to do his dirty work. And thinking about, I mean, how how to the Trinity and all that works and, and sending it, but it really, it really gave me a different viewpoint on God and Jesus and you know, John three sixteen. We've been saying, you know, most Christians have been reciting that since they were probably in first grade, and it knew it by heart, if not sooner. And God sent His only Son, da da da. And you know it, you think it, but to me, it puts a like a blue collar spin that Jesus or God and Jesus, the Trinity, they're not a, they're not above getting as dirty as need be to make this happen. And I mean, it, it sounds dumb, but it just, 
It, it, it sounds dumb coming out of my mouth, and I, I'm not being able to. I'm not explaining it the way I wish I could, the way it made me feel. But that was that was really powerful. I have a different view of God today than I did before Saturday, and I can't explain to you why that is more than just. I mean, they're like benevolent, yes. But there's something really compelling, isn't there, Randy, about the idea that an that an all powerful deity, the only the, the a deity that claims that they're the only deity, yeah, that 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 God who makes the rules would play by their own rules, right, and like, then would allow themselves to suffer it's a it's an interesting thing you know you there's the science of it will and the theories will go on and on but to me that's that's what for me is so emotionally satisfying about the theory that i have on it is that for me one of my non-negotiables is that god is love Uh, and i i can concede a lot of other things but I believe that God is love. And if God is love, then there are certain other things that then become non-negotiables, I guess, if you would say. And and I think that a reasonable person could read the Bible and come to a very different conclusion about whether God was love or not. Yeah, yeah. Be- when you read through some of the passages and some of the things that God says and does— I think a reasonable person could say, I don't know that God really is love. But that's the conclusion I've come to. And for me, I've come to a place where it's not that I'm unwilling to consider other things. It's just you would have to really work hard to convince me that God Mm. isn't love. Yeah. And so for me, that's why this theory works so well, because a loving God cares about me and sent himself didn't create some something else someone else to do what was going to be hard and painful but chose to take that on and do it and um to me that's what you know for me what really works and what i love about it melanie's looking over me looking yeah. over her microphone at <laughs> melanie me. has it and i'm just no. she had that look and then yeah. she looked at ken i'm like okay go now yeah, we're just waiting for her to the, the microphone just, is yours go ahead and speak heresy melanie go ahead and do it <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's it's what I'm here for, is it not? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's it's really difficult. I think, and and honestly, I think the idea of penal substitutionary atonement is really difficult for a lot of people, even if they believe that it is true. Because I mean, like you mentioned, Ken, you're like, this is my theory. This is this is this is what works yeah. for me. But you also admitted that there are holes sure. in that theory. And there are still some really difficult questions that you have to ask if that's if that is a theory that um, that speaks to you. I mean, there are a lot of other different theories out there that that um, that people have played with, <clears throat> but um, I think it's I think it's fair to at least mention that um, that there that there are some very significant problems with it. And I'm 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 just being the the problem child in the room. Right Devil's now. advocate's a great role. I mean, because because here 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 are some of the questions, and I'm only going to say these because I know that there are probably people listening who are like, "But what about this?" Yeah. <laughs> so one of the issues is, who is really in charge? Is God really in charge, or is there something that God has to do to pay? Is is sin in charge? Is evil in charge? What what is it that God has to do to pay for uh, what has been set up? And I know that you you touched on that a little bit, but that's one of the issues. Another issue is in terms of God sending His only Son. I mean, you could think of that as wow, an amazing sacrifice that that God made, and how loving that is. Or you could think, wow, would I would I inflict that on someone that I loved? Mm. You know, would I inflict that on, I mean, and, and also, I mean, and, and this is one of the questions that came in. I swear this was not my question. I did not put this in, Ken. <laughs> but one of the questions that I think Randy will probably get to later is, is the fact that God created the system where 
death was the requirement and then subjected God's self to the death that was the requirement. So, I mean, there are these pieces that are a little bit Game of Thrones, actually. They're, I guess for me, though, the part... It, it, there yeah. are some intense sort of violent... Sure. But to me, that's like, I guess for me, and again, going to why I, this works so well for me, <laughs> is that, I mean, it's like, to me, it's like blaming God for gravity. It's like, oh, gravity kills so many people every year. Well, it does. It kills a lot of people every year, but it also kind of keeps everything together, keeps us anchored to the earth, and it's just part of what it takes to have us not just floating off into nothingness. And you can't so, jump a train bridge if there's no Yeah, gravity. a train bridge, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah, there's another story for another time, huh? But anyway, this- uh, It's not as so, random as it sounds. Yeah, not at all. But my, I guess my thing is that if, if there are no rules, no laws, no nothing- then there's just chaos, and that's all there is to it. So why did God say that, that death had to be the penalty for sin? Good question. Um, is it because that f- is it is it similar to saying that falling is the result of gravity? If you step off a cliff, and somebody is somebody being mean by saying. Well, I created gravity, and if you really cared, you wouldn't, you know, whenever I wanted to step off a cliff, I could. But I thought God created sin to be, or not that he created sin, but knowing. Be careful there. Yeah, well, that was, but, but being, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just admit, I struggle with, with that idea of, you know, did God create it or did he allow it? And because he created Lucifer and he knew what Lucifer was going to do, so in a sense— See, but again, See, this all comes to me to that, that I mean, whole I'm, I'm just, freedom. I know. It I know. comes down to freedom. And if God didn't create Lucifer, then God would be creating only robots. He'd only be creating people that are, are beings that would do what he wanted them to do, and that's not freedom. Yeah. And and who would have known if he hadn't? He would have. And when you have a, a set of values, you follow your values. But to that end, it seems to me that the the idea of the sin that he knew would be introduced into the garden and eventually the fall of mankind, it seems like the sin had to be as diabolically opposed as to his character as possible. So maybe it's the it was his way of the two should be pretty easy to spot. You know, there shouldn't be any cross. There shouldn't be. I mean, I know that you can get into minutia and there's gray areas in between, but typically you would think that it would be something clear and concise. But well, okay. So let's let's just imagine <laughs> that you have two children, yeah, and one of your children beats up your other child. Yeah, they probably deserved it. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just Randy. Sorry, behave yourself. Yes. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Let's see, you, and then one child beats up on the other child and beats up on the other child. And you as a parent say, because I believe in freedom, I'm going to allow my one child to beat up on my other child. Does that seem like that's something that, 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 that proves that you are a person who values freedom? Or does that seem like a problematic dynamic. Well, it goes back then to why there's a penalty. Because God didn't just allow that to happen. There was there were consequences. And f- furthermore, I just I think those aren't I I don't see that as being equal in metaphor land that you have two children i think that when it's okay so what ages are we talking about the children are we talking about them at 30 or are we talking about them at four at 30 your your children you may not be able to do anything about what what they're doing to each other you may ask them to stop but you may or you may have the consequences that the law 
imp, you know, brings around. So I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I was thinking more in terms of, you know, <clears throat> there was war in heaven and, you know, the dragon and his angels fought against, mm-hmm. you know, that that was that was that's sure. the sort of terrible metaphor that I was trying to create in terms of, you know, you you have something with with power mm-hmm. <laughs> you have something with less power but you allow the thing with more power to overpower the thing with less power to prove something about yourself weren't they all equally powerful well n- well he was not on earth <laughs> not on earth <laughs> i guess well <laughs> start I, talking about humans and but what other about beings. the other i mean all the i mean yeah satan had his his contingency of angels but you had a whole nother group that allegedly still has the same freedom and they didn't go anywhere so again, allowing sin to be created to, to me doesn't prove anything that that was freedom. It just, I mean, or is there, I mean, inherently there's bad apples with freedom. Freedom is, uh, freedom just a, empowers people to find the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Well, that's a great vote of confidence for the concept of freedom. Well, I, I don't like it either, but it just seems <laughs> like it, there's not a lot of hard and fast answers. And I think that. Well, I just had to throw some difficulties no, no, out no. there because, I mean, yeah. there are some difficulties. Crying sure. to himself on the cross, though, how does that work with God? And, Say again. Well, I'm you, talking you, to you. You mentioned like, you my know. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, and, and then, you know, and then praying to the Father. And again, I, I know that's part of understanding the Trinity, but that also, I mean, I, and again, this is why I guess this is an eternity issue that we still, once we're a whole lot smarter, once we get to heaven, and no more things. It's it's still going to be a mystery. Well, yeah. I mean, so, and who died? Right. Who died on yeah. the cross? <laughs> and so those were things that just I mean, immediately jumped out at me. I actually I had somebody come up to me after church and say, "What is death?" Then that's a good question. Yeah, no, because sure. what is death? Because and I told them I'd talk about it on podcast. So here we go. Okay, <laughs> here yeah, we right. go. We're checking them off here. Because <laughs> they basically said, "Did Jesus really die?" Hmm. I mean, did Jesus really die? Did he, because he was raised on Sunday morning, and so what is death then? Is death? It's to sleep, isn't it? Just it's like- to sleep. But but is but it. So then, what did God mean when He said, "When you eat of the fruit of this tree, you'll die"? So the Seventh Day Adventist denomination's official position is: there's two kinds of death. The first one is asleep. The, the second, second one is eternal. eternal. Yeah. So. The person rightly asked, so then which one did Jesus die? Seventh-day Adventists take the position that it's the second death that Jesus experienced, but was not held to the consequence of. In other words, so he felt like he was going to die forever, but he didn't. But how does he, He's. I mean, if he's God, how does he not know? I mean, and that's the, that's the difference between being Jesus and being God and the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. Some things were kept from him. You think, or 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 humanity shrouded? Hmm. Uh, oh man, so many questions. Well, I guess if you're God, you can say, "Here's here." here. You can do anything, <laughs> yeah, and therefore you limit your own omniscience. Was that there? You go. Okay. Wow. Well, there well, solved no, that. We'll That's go with that good. theory. That's a good one. <laughs> no, I like it because let's get into the questions because I think where I heard us land was. Faith really seems to be the answer. I mean, even for Jesus going through the crucifixion then, I mean, he had to have faith that he was not cut off from the Father, or he at least had to have the the will to say, you know, I'm going to do it. And if I'm, if you're not who I think you are, or if I'm wrong, or however this, whatever this looks like, I'm going to do it anyway. And we could get into what kind of faith does it take to believe in all this when there are so many questions and there's so many things that we are told we're not going to understand here. And I, I wonder where do we leave? <laughs> and maybe this isn't the, you know, maybe this isn't a new Christian kind of question that they're thinking about because it's, it's pretty deep. Yeah. People have been arguing about this for a few thousand years. Oh, right. So, so is, I mean, do we leave that as, you know, study, pray, and but don't let it consume you. It just, I mean, does it matter? Yeah. There are things that matter that we don't understand. Okay. Or that we're studying. That's true. And it's so, yeah, I believe it matters. I also believe it's okay to say, hey, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm still studying. It's like, but I don't, I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't know math just because you don't know calculus. 
or you don't, okay. or you don't know algebra two. It just means you're not, you're, you're, I don't know algebra two. Oh, believe me, I don't either. <laughs> I really um, don't. It, it's just not complete, but you do. I mean, yeah. there are some things I believe that you can, that you can know the basics of, and it doesn't mean your knowledge is complete or even close to, so you shouldn't stop. But you're also not, you know, you know, mathematically illiterate. Yeah. You're just, you don't know. And who you, does know everything that there is to know about mathematics? But you can still love the math that you know. Sure. You can exactly. still be, you can still excel yeah. at the math that you know. Exactly. So. All right. So we're going to do the questions a little bit differently because um, mom, doc, you are my hero this week. I'm just going to give you that because. <laughs> Literally, I felt like she was asking her questions through each part of the sermon. And I felt the same way because the pieces and parts that I had written down, because I, today before we sat down to record, I watched the message for a fourth time. Because honestly, I kept getting lost because when I asked this, some of these questions, I, I have no idea what I think. I have no idea. I hadn't thought about this before this way. And so I felt like I was really going off on like an ADD filled tangent like I couldn't get out of. And now I'm not putting that on mom, doc, because I'm not going <laughs> to speak how that worked for her. But for me, I just felt like, whoa. I have to stop here. And then I'd watch again, stop, watch again. But uh, so I'm going to read all both of her questions and then her her kind of realization at the end or her statement at the end. And then we can dissect those uh, from there. She said, I was once told that as sinners, if we lived forever, evil would get so severe that we would destroy ourselves. That is why sin had to bring death as it would be unloving to allow us to exist forever. For instance, what if Hitler and Stalin had lived forever? Secondly, she said, if Jesus had not died for us, how would we hope for eternity? How would salvation be possible? And then she wrote, I can see why this topic will be going on for eternity <laughs> as my questions keep coming. So just know that you were not alone as I really struggled with having to go through this again and again. And and now I'm stuck with substitutionary atonement in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I Googled it, so I'm really in trouble. So what, what if Jesus had just chosen something different? How would how would we hope for eternity? How would salvation be possible? Because God could have done it another way, and we don't know why he didn't, but this is the way he chose. So is the answer, we don't know, it just would be something other than this that would make as much sense or more? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just... No. Sure, I mean, th and there are, like I, well, I mean, Ken mentioned this too, there are a lot of theories out there. There's the ransom theory, there's Christus Victor, there's uh, the satisfaction theory, there's moral exemplar, there's, I mean, there are a whole bunch of different theories that people have come up with to try to to get at the mystery. And I don't know that we will ever completely get at the mystery. mystery I think, it, you know, yeah. part of it is, part of it is though... And, and I asked these questions and I'm, I was the problem child there for a few minutes, but, but the fact is I enjoy this and I enjoy digging into yeah. it because, because I feel like the process of thinking about this is worthy. Mm -hmm. The process of even asking those questions and pondering it is worthy. And what if we figure out a, a one or two and, and maybe not a consensus? Cause I think obviously, like you said, people have been arguing this for years, but even if it's just our own personal idea that, you know, Ken said, you know, this is, this is where I land and this is where I'm comfortable for all the reasons I've listed. And even if you come up with one or two, who knows what other piece of the puzzle that you've struggled with God, that that might help answer or bring you some relief on. So I think it's definitely worthy to be asking the questions. For sure. So then what made it, and maybe her first part about, you know, what if sin had gone on or had been allowed to go on and, and how bad it could have gotten. And it made me think of the flood, you know, that God said, man, it really did get pretty bad. And this is why I'm wiping this, wiping this slate clean. And then, but oddly promising not to do it again with the flood, but eventually we are doing it again at the second coming, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those really, <laughs> what what mom doc said is one theory it's that that god made death the penalty because 
who wants to live forever in agony and suffering mm, yeah. um, that, that, that sin causes. And so that makes God actually morally kind to allow sinners to quit suffering instead of continue to suffer and be in pain. And I don't, you know, I don't know. I've, I've been around enough people who were ready to die that, you know, I'll just say, I remember having a kidney stone and just thinking if this is going to be the rest of my life, (laughs) no, thank you. (laughs) No, thank you. And that's not at all me taking away from the beauty of life and how, how, important life is and how it's worth fighting for and it's but it is me saying that that the world that we live in is incredibly painful and it is incredibly hard and um you know a multitude of books and movies have taken on this concept of what what happens if you live forever in an imperfect world as an imperfect person, is that something that you want to do? Probably the one that comes to mind the most is maybe like Tuck Everlasting or something like that. But what happens if you do live on forever? Mm. In in and so that is a theory that God gave the gift of death, not as not as as some horrific punishment but as a gift to yeah. say you don't have to live that way yeah we do i think we we tend to have a more western view of death you know we don't spend a lot of time talking to it uh, talking about sometimes we talk to it <laughs> <laughs> we don't spend a lot of time talking about it we try to avoid it we try to avoid looking like we're heading that direction <laughs> you know there and yet there have been a lot of books and and things that i've i've read that talk about actually making friends with your own death and and the process of life being the process of giving yourself away in such a way that you make yourself small enough to fit through the hole of death. Hmm. And and when you think about the way that things way, way that we have seasons, things die to nurture the life that comes out of it. I mean, we see this over and over, over again. And over, so yeah. so even though the wages of sin is death, it also, like you said, can is is a gift that can create life but i think that's the beauty of why we follow jesus though is people go through stages in their life where you talk like you know do do you talk to your death and some people do some people drive right up to it and slap it in the face and go i dare you you know and (laughs) people who jump off of railroad right people or you know i mean think like we're in the presence of someone (laughs) that conversation a few times (laughs) (laughs) but think about people that do like push the boundaries of everything, astronauts, yeah. extreme sports. I mean, all these people like, and to what Ken said, the beauty of life and not to, not to try to shorten yours, but to live it. However, you've been wired to live it to the fullest. I think that's a, a huge compliment in that, in that arena to just realize that it's short and finite. And even if you get, what, even if you live to be a hundred years old, I mean, what's a hundred years and how did you live it? Did you live it the way, that you and God envisioned your life going and that you were full of blessings and you were, you didn't, you left with no regrets or did you, did you just get bogged down in all the weight of everything? And I think that's a, I think that, I think that actually takes uh, and, and will change our view on this very subject on what, whether or not God is that good God that, you know, all fits in. He did, he, you know, he made the rules and then he followed him and that means you can trust him and have faith that when he says he's coming to get you, he's coming to get you. Yeah. I think that was maybe the and the, that in the eternity beautiful. in living forever, yeah, in well, a perfect yeah, I know scenario. It's will, not a bad bail. Will be a good thing. Yeah. All right, we are down to the end. We already covered the teaser question about God making the rules and <laughs> why did He make the penalty of death. So Alicia said, "I remember a time I had the sacrilegious thought." Well, why does God get it to be all about him, especially considering Corinthians 13, and that it's all about love and humbling ourselves and sacrifice? It clicked with me during this sermon that Jesus dying was the answer to that question I had so long ago. God also sacrifices, is humble, and loves. Hmm. See, now we even had, we had some revelations during the, We had questions. We had revelations. We had some things that uh, clicked and made sense. So... I think for that question or those two questions, I think we did about as good as you can do. There you go. Right? 
So sure. if you have any more questions, it's Ken at whole life. <laughs> or Church. as good as we're going to do right now. All right, later, yeah. <laughs> we may have to debate. This might have to be great question. 2024 part two. <laughs> To uh, follow up in case we've had and 2028 some... and 2057. <laughs> what did you say? There? Maybe 3, we just need to have each one of the, uh, the pastoral team preach through this. Then yes, yes. Who's taking that? Take. So truth is progressive. So yep. maybe we'll have a little bit more there next is. time. All right. So that is what? Oh, what is the new series? I didn't catch the new t- uh, the, oh. what we're naming it this year. It's like That's you know, it's our voices, 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 voices of whole life. life. Is it voice of whole life? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Then it's That's right where, where we going. have. And just because you guys podcast listeners are so amazing, I'm going to give yes. you the full lineup. Can I do that, <gasps> Melanie? Do it. Can you? Yeah. So uh, leading off this this Sabbath, um, in no particular order, no particular order. <laughs> Drum roll. Um, <laughs> is uh, my wife Rochelle? She's going to be t- uh, preaching about people pleasing, mm-hmm. and so it's going to be an, it's going to be interesting. So, and then the Sabbath after that, we have Audrey, Audrey Gregory, Gregory. Mm-hmm. and then oh, okay. she's nice. uh, fabulous. You guys have uh, heard uh, Audrey sing before. Mm-hmm. She you, She's one of our worship team often. And then uh, we have Stanton Reed, who's one of our worship mm. hosts, who uh, that um, he was supposed to preach last year, but uh, had right. something... A family member that passed away wasn't able to do it, so I'm really excited to have him yeah. back. He'll be preaching next. And then uh, wrapping it all up is um, Angela Consequeo. And some people are like, well, who is Angela Consequeo? But if you called the, the whole life office right when I was first here for about the first six months that I was here and maybe the six months before I got here, uh, you would have heard Angela's uh, just kind, warm voice on the phone because she was our executive assistant here in the office, and uh, she's a, a mom and uh, just a bright businesswoman. Overall, and, awesome person. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're we're thrilled to have Angela um, speaking as well. So this is going to be a great yeah, lineup. It is. I'm excited. Well, I'm excited too, just because I feel like. You know, the questions and the interaction and the fact that we don't shy away from trying to answer at least puts you on a, a, some ideas, puts you at ease that, you know, we can think about them, we can, yeah. we can disagree about them, but that we're not going to shy away from can I tease the, the high one. Can I tease the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. S- series after the Voices oh, of Whole Life? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, is that what I think it is? I, I think it is. Probably. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, get, <laughs> we're doing get a, your popcorn ready. We're doing a nine-week series uh, on The Chosen. And so we're going to feature episodes that are some of our staff Mm -hmm. uh, members' favorite episodes. Episode two, season three, if if we could, please. (laughs) We'll uh, we'll take that under advisement, sir. I believe we are also going to have a uh, a, a few viewings. Yes. And that's, thank you, because (laughs) that is where I was actually, why I wanted to tease this. In July and August, mark off your Friday evenings Mm -hmm. because we're going to have, we're going to watch the episode that I'll be preaching on the next day. We're going to watch it Friday night and uh, we'll probably, we'll watch the episode. I think we'll have a little bit of time for discussion afterwards uh, for those who want to do it. We'll, and so it's going to be a really nice time as a church. If you want to come on Friday night, watch the episode together with your friends, your family here. And then the next day I'll preach on that particular episode mm. and it'll be uh, be a good, rich experience together. Season that three, episode two. Season three, episode two. <laughs> um, also, season three, season episode three. two. <laughs> but after that, season three, episode two, this is a great time if you have thought of this a coworker, a friend, yeah. uh, maybe your neighbor that has – Knows, you know, you go to church and maybe a, something Friday night's a little less uh, intimidating than Saturday. And so bring them along and then maybe like, hey, come on back tomorrow. Let's uh, let's let's do that together. The um, and, and that's a fair warning to everybody upcoming that if you're going to participate in church for an entirety, how long do you say? Six weeks? Nine weeks. Nine weeks. Nine, Nine weeks. weeks. Although in the middle, we have we have a little <laughs> a little break in the middle. Special chosen. Special chosen in the middle. Uh, in the middle, so yeah. it may actually only special chosen yeah. in the middle. Tell yeah. us more. Or we're not we're not sharing that much. I think we can. Yeah. Do, what we, do you think? Well, first of all, that we have right in the middle is our VBS ah, week, so yes. that's going to be really special. We've mm-hmm. Got programming for the kids, and then uh, that Sabbath we have we have a, two speakers actually, kind of. Ken and 
Bernie Anderson. Bernie Anderson. Yeah. Um, right. For some of you will remember, almost two years ago, we we did a world vision a world vision project where kids chose us instead of us choosing them. Still very cool. And the cool thing is, we're going to give everybody. We're going to actually do a little update. And so, if you weren't here two years ago and you want to sponsor a child and have that child choose you, you're going to have that opportunity. But the cool thing is that now that COVID is not a thing anymore, uh, World Vision is flying me and Rochelle down to Guatemala to the village where we have our kids. And I'm going to get to meet all of our kids and get some fun video and see what uh, World Vision is doing with all the funds that we've been donating to make this happen. And so, ah, very cool. So, and I, so the cool thing is, I fly out, I preach on, uh, Bernie and I will preach on that Sabbath. I'll fly out on Sunday and I'll be back by Friday to preach. And you're only going halfway across the world. Just, well, no, down. It's not so it's not far. Even, uh, <laughs> seems like it. So, yeah. So, I'll, I'll be back for the next Sabbath. So, I won't even, I won't even miss a won't Sabbath. Won't even miss a Sabbath. Yeah. So, and you'll get to see a video of, of everything that happened. It's going to be awesome. That's going to be fun. And finally, this is, this is your, like, this is your first of probably a few, but it's only like a month. So, this is one of your first spoiler alert. If you haven't seen The Chosen and you want to see it before we do it together or you're partway through it and you, we might pick an episode you haven't seen yet, mm. it's time to get through yeah. The Chosen. Yeah, it's free. So it's, well, it is free or you can donate. Just saying. Yeah. In pay fact, you should forward. probably pay, yeah. pay it forward, even though it because seems like they're com- getting some good money from some different places now. Well, we complain because Christian programming is usually pretty shoddy overall, yeah. production wise and usually pretty much all wise. And <laughs> I mean, I'm you know I've been I've been that creator, so I know, and you know I, I have produced a TV show, and uh, yeah, whatever, you know, and so it's just like hey, but you but you pre, you know you do it on the budget that you have, which is nothing, and you you do it for your love of the Lord, and so sometimes production value has to suffer. So for once, we have this really great series that's been so well produced, so well written, so you know support it a little, but catch up so you don't get any spoilers. There you go. All right. Well, Jeff, we missed you. Hope you're back next week. Feel better, Jeff. And that you feel better. And for everyone else, if you're feeling the bug, get your vitamin C, get your sleep, and get back at it. And Now, we're recording podcasts after church service, after second service, right? Yep. Yep. Could people hang around and watch that if they wanted to? Uh, Yeah, if they they felt the, you know, we could, uh, well... I don't know how many people can. <laughs> how many sneak? can we cram? Oh, in are here? we going to do it up in? We're going to do it up in this room. So we're not doing it downstairs. We're going to do it up up in the office. Yeah, yeah. That, well, so that might be harder. That I makes mean, sense. So we we're could. selling raffle tickets. <laughs> 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 well, we could biggest podcast yes. fan that gives Randy the the best reason why they're the best fan gets right. to sit in. No, no, and, and seriously though, I mean, there have been people that have asked, you know, could we come and sit? Of course, you could. Just let us know. It's Tuesday, usually about one thirty. You'd have to come by. We have an extra stool that you can sit in the corner, and uh, you could, you know, hang in. And if you had something to say, we might even set up a microphone for you. Just saying. Boom. So there you go. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Next week, Rochelle Wetmore makes her. Uh, she said teaching. She's going to teach. She's not going to preach. That's what she she's, told me. She's preaching. Okay. She's making her she's whole preaching. life preaching. You know what? Uh, she's doing whatever she wants to do. And uh, that's good well, that's with kind all of, of us. That's kind of where I was going with that. So, <laughs> Rochelle, I didn't say it. Now, you heard Melanie correct me. So, I heard teaching is what you told me. So, that's what I'm sticking with. But anyway, Rochelle will be here next week. I'm looking forward to that, as I'm sure you are as well. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks for listening and have a great week. 